Good morning. It's early on a Saturday morning and we've tried to create the space for the room to fill up a little bit, so we appreciate you all being patient with us. Uh, my name is Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway. I am a co-director of the Social Justice Institute. Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Mark Chupp, uh, co-director of the Social Justice Institute uh, and also a professor here. And uh, we are delighted to have you with us. We had, many of you know, Derricka Purnell with us on the first night of Think Tank uh, in conversation with one of our um, second year undergrad students around abolitionism and, and all of the things that um, folks are thinking about and talking about. Uh, and, 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 and so, and then we had spoken word last night with Raja Bell Freeman. I see a lot of faces from last night here it was she is a gift and a talent she was such such a treat I'm so grateful that she was with us um, and then we had a panel on liberation through democracy question mark um, I added the question mark after the fact um, and and that conversation was really fruitful I think um, we are excited that you all are with us we have a full day in store uh, our first panel on community safety uh, second panel on on health and liberation, and then the third panel on education. Um, as promised, you all have heard me talk about the role of the the integral role of the arts um, as we imagine liberation, as we move towards transforming what our present existence looked like to a more liberated state for us individually and collectively as community. And the talent that we have in store today just makes me smile from ear to ear. Uh, first we have with us Tandi Wiley, who is in the corner here with the map of Cleveland and then another blank space. Uh, and she is an amazing artist uh, and talent of, of, of many, many, many talents. Uh, but today she's sharing her art talent with us. And so, Tandi, correct me if I'm wrong. Do not hesitate to correct me if I'm wrong. But one of the aims of this is for participants to provide some sort of artistic expression in their neck of the woods on that map of what liberation looks like for them. Is that right? Okay, so so you get to draw, paint, whatever that is in your area. Um, uh, I don't know if that's the whole county or is that just Cleveland proper? Let me put my glasses on. Is Cleveland proper? Okay, Cleveland proper. So if you're like me, who's lived here forever, uh, I have lived in East Cleveland, the city of Cleveland, U Euclid, Shaker Heights, right? I've lived all over this city, but I'm going to rep uh, Mount Pleasant because my family grew up uh, um, at 116th at the park and my father's um, family still lives on 123rd and Dove, right? So so if you have, if you don't live in Cleveland, uh, but but, but you work in a place that's uh, inside of Cleveland proper, then you should rep uh, that space and, and think about what liberation looks like in that area. Um, I'm really, really excited about that. That's throughout the day, so no pressure. I'm not artistic at all, so it's gonna take me maybe a little bit to, to warm up to the idea of that. And I'm sure Tandi will help us, right? Guide us through some pieces and parts of that. Um, and then I'll, I'll just leave with introducing Tandi for now and not bother, not bother, right? But, but save the other, the other treats, the theater performances and the other pieces and parts for when it's, when it's timely, okay? All right. So we did a, a full land acknowledgement on Friday night and it's in your, uh, Thursday night, and it's in your program. And we just wanna acknowledge again that tonight or to this morning, we begin with gratitude for the earth and we recognize and acknowledge and, and, and express our appreciation for those who lived and worked here before us, those whose stewardship and resilient spirit makes our residents possible on these ancestral lands. And so if you look through your whole program, you'll, uh, you'll see the whole land acknowledgement. And we encourage you to use that as an opportunity for educating ourselves and taking action. Um, and so just uh, take a look at that. 
I wanted to say just a minute uh, about kind of putting this uh, think tank in context. Many of you are, are familiar and very frequent uh, participants in the Social Justice Institute. And in recognizing uh, the land acknowledgement, we also recognize something of our history of, uh, that was rooted in abolitionism. And we were honored to have Dr. Fania Davis come last year and speak uh, at one of our forums. And she recognized the role that abolition uh, had in our early history. And so part of that history included uh, um, a commitment to abolitionism and actually com having Frederick Douglass speak at a commencement in 1854. She challenged us and she said, uh, what would it be like for the social, for Case Western Reserve University a hundred years from now to be known as a leader in abolitionism at this time? And so it's fitting that we invited Derricka Purnell here on Thursday night to be our keynote speaker about becoming abolitionist. And so we, we embrace that challenge and we are working toward that. The other thing that I just want to lift up that I, because I have a history of working in restorative justice, is the four R's of restorative justice that, that Dr. Davis talked about. And I think it's fitting that we think about those today. The first R is publicly recognize harm, take responsibility for the harm, take reparative action, and work to repent, re prevent the recurrence of harm. So in that restorative space, we want to create the kind of space where you feel comfortable and we are working at liberation and we are taking care of ourselves. So we're excited that you're, you're here and we recognize people come from different walks of life. Some of you are working from within systems and institutions trying to transform them. Erica uh, Anthony last night said it so well and I just love what she said. She said, I, am, I recognize I am working within a system that I am actively trying to dismantle. And so I think that really says it well. Some of us are working from the outside, protesting and demanding transformation or dismantling of these systems and institutions and that's our primary efforts. Others of us are working at creating alternatives to these systems and creating demonstrations that there is a better way. And others still are working at that individual work, how we work at change one person at a time, because we do know that we have to heal in order for us to, to be uh, in the process of pursuing justice and liberation. So in that spirit, we've done the, the arts and the theater. We've also created a community care room. So it's outside this, build, out this, outside this room, go to the right, and at the top of the stairs to the right, you'll see a sign that says Community Care Room Social Justice Institute. And that room is there for you all day today. And there's yoga mats, there's art materials, there's um, uh, active, uh, there's places for you to rest. I talked last night about Bishop Hersey's uh, nap ministry and she says rest is resistance. And so we want you to be serious about uh, taking care of yourselves. And, and if you need to take a nap, you can go take a nap in there. So um, the, and we have to resist the demands of the grind culture that just pushes us and pushes us to exhaustion. And so we want you to do that. And as part of that, you don't even have to leave the room because we've created these regulation stations. Dr. Jenny King uh, from the uh, Center on Trauma and Adversity uh, at the Mandel School here on campus uh, says we don't need so much to heal our nervous systems as we need to hear our nervous systems. Pay attention to what our body is telling us. Many of us are exhausted from trauma, from uh, generational, intergenerational trauma, from ongoing oppression. Pay attention to our bodies. And, and so we've created these regulation stations. There's a little sign here that says, self-care is something we all need and it is more than taking a day off for a retreat. It only takes a few seconds or a minute to soothe the body's stress response. Taking time throughout the day for a dose of self-care will you improve your ability to regulate stress. When you finish, please return the items for others to use. So we have a lot of fun things. There's uh, one of these boxes in the, in the rows and there's one at each table. There's markers, there's little things to squeeze. Uh, um, as stress balls, there's, there's a little bit of Play-Doh, there's markers, there's, there's paper, there's uh, colored pencils. So 
throughout the day you can pick up some of those things, work with them. I see this table's actively engaged right now. Uh, and so there's a slinky and uh, those are there and uh, we encourage you to use those. And I'll just end with saying in terms of the community care room, I would like you to, to think about that as a space for you to, to individually take care of what you need. And in that, that probably means it should be probably pretty quiet. Um, and, and we want you to interact with each other, but we also recognize uh, the role of privacy in, in uh, Bell Hooks and her book, All About Love says, in our culture, privacy is often confused with secrecy. Open, honest, truth-telling individuals value privacy. We all need spaces where we can be alone with thoughts and feelings where we can experience healthy psychological autonomy and can choose to share what, when we want to. I'm a big person that values, Aisha knows this, uh, people sharing and talking with each other. But you know, do that to, your, to the extent you're comfortable. And if you're at a table and you just wanna be uh, you know, with your own thoughts, that's fine too. So at lunch, we'll have some conversations and that, that message will be given then too. Share only to the extent that you're comfortable. So we're grateful that you are here, you've taken time to be with us. We invite you to do what you need to receive the balm for what ails you and pursue liberation and continue your path on becoming. So thank you. It's so interesting. I hear Mark talk about those things and I'm like, yep, a toy, a slinky ain't really going to get what I need today. Uh, <laughs> It's just not, it's just not. Uh, but I but I personally dealt with a lot of loss here lately, right? Uh, in the last two weeks, too many things have happened for the Slinky to be it. Uh, and as much as I love being in the presence of you all, I am encouraging myself to do what I need to do outside of the space and the, and the gaze of others uh, in order to get what I need. I hope the conversations today provoke you all to, to be mindful of that, but I am not under any pretense of believing that uh, being here here with us is going to give you what you need and I'm not and I'm and 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 yeah so so take care of yourselves throughout and in the ways that you need to and I fully recognize that by being here in some ways that's in tension with the message that we're giving um, so but I think we're in for a treat and that gives me energy and excitement uh, to make it through the day. So our first panel on community safety and liberation, uh, we have three dynamic, uh, and the goal here uh, in, 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 in envisioning what this panel would be, would be for us to talk from both an academic and a practitioner perspective on what community safety looks like for us uh, in, in our neighborhoods and in our areas in our regions um, and so and so I am delighted that the people who I thought were essential to be in this conversation are all here in one room uh, we have Monica C Bell she's a professor of law and associate professor of sociology at Yale University Bell works at the intersection of law and sociology using sociological tools to explore a wide variety of legal questions mostly those focused on race and class and quality. Her writing is magnificent. Some subject matters that Bell has focused on include policing, structural and interpersonal violence, safety and security, welfare and public benefits, and housing and residential segregation. Her scholarship aims to center the voices and perspectives of people who experience legal exclusion she uses multiple techniques for analysis, theory construction, and data presentation with an emphasis on qualitative methodology and inductive theory building. Absolutely, I've read it. She does all of that and then some. Bell Scholarship has been published in leading scholarly journals and major media outlets. Bell has received recognition for her scholarship, teaching, and mentorship, such as the 2019 Yale Law Women Faculty Excellence Award, the 2021 Jane Addams Article Award for the American Sociological Association, and the 2021 Visiting Scholar uh, Fellowship at the Russell Sage Foundation, as well as the 2022 Derek A. Bell Jr. Um, Award from the American Association of Law Schools. I should say, although we share a surname, Bell, um, I, maybe I'm on this gene genealogical dig, perhaps I will find out 
thought that we are related. Uh, I also would love to know that I'm related to Derek Bell, uh, but I haven't yet gotten there. Uh, there will be big blazing signs announcing it um, if ancestry confirms. Um, <laughs> our next panelist is Kareem Hinton. Kareem Hinton is co-founder of Black Lives Matter Cleveland and a bail advocate. He was compelled to be an advocate after two notorious shootings by the Cleveland police. And he comes to activism and, bail and the bail reform movement after working hard towards police reform. Hinton's journey as an activist and political strategist for change has involved him in spearheading campaigns to shape and influence political appointments in the Northern District of Ohio. That's the federal court here, uh, seated in Cuyahoga County. And most recently, Hinton and others successfully campaigned success, oh, that's, that's, that's my fault, campaigned successfully against the Cuyahoga County local government's plan to construct a new larger jail on toxic <laughs> land. On Thursday night, those Mark made it a point to lift up that win for our attendees in the space, um, the win uh, that allows uh, or that prevents us from having a new jail built and built on toxic land, and that's important to recognize. Our final panelist is Kevin Truitt. Kevin is the Legal Advocacy Director, let me start over, he's the Legal Advocacy Director for Disability Rights Ohio, a nonprofit civil rights organization for people with disabilities in Ohio and the state's protection and advocacy system. Truett has been attorney with DRO since 2007 and oversees that organization's legal and policy work, including efforts to address racial disparities and serious injustices in the access to special education services for kids with disabilities and in the access to effective mental health care for adults that enables them to be free from police violence, incarceration, and institutionalization. Truett is also the execu on the executive committee of the Ohio chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. We have a chapter, a student chapter at the law school as well, which is dedicated to the need for basic change in the structure of our political and economic systems and seeks to unite lawyers, law students, legal workers, and jailhouse lawyers to, ser to function as an effective force in the service of people to end the, that to that end, to the end that human rights shall be regarded as more sacred than property rights, right? So their purpose is to ensure that human rights are more sacred than, pro than property rights. Um, I am grateful for our three panelists. Please join me here on the stage. Kevin and I were on a podcast together in Columbus. That's how I met him. Um, and that conversation was so fruitful. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you made the drive up from Columbus. If I could ask you all uh, perhaps to uh, simply uh, share your opening initial remarks in the order in which I, uh, we're just going to do alphabetical order. It seems the fairest way to me, if that's OK with you all, unless y'all want to do rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Um, uh, I'll have you all share in that order. We're, as always, we're going to open for questions. I am going to uh, ask that you keep your questions as succinct um, and abbreviated in time as, right, uh, as possible. And uh, that um, you direct, if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, please call that out at the time that you frame your question. And panelists don't feel compelled to answer uh, every question if it's not directed at you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am so honored to be here in Cleveland with you. My name is Monica Bell. And I wanted to say a few words, you know, it's on some level, it's like I almost feel like I shouldn't be speaking in the sense that, you know, I really admire the work of the people who are sitting here beside me and I really want to leave much more space for them. But I thought maybe it'd be helpful to say a few words about kind of um, some research that I've done in Cleveland in the past and particularly, in, in particular to say a little bit about kind of what the process of liberation and broadening ideas of community safety really means and kind of what, what we kind of struggle with. So um, 
the research that I did um, here in Cleveland, um, and is actually importantly throughout Cuyahoga County, and not just in Cleveland proper, um, and the reason that's important is, is this was all taking place in 2013, 2014, so at this point quite some time ago. But I think it sheds light on both kind of the opportunities that movement action have created, but also some of the deep um, issues that we have in terms of building strategies for community liberation. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so I think often in conversations about transforming the criminal system, changing policing, we tend to overlook the fact, not totally, we tend, to, we tend not to go deep enough into how um, uh, kind of committed certain communities are and certain people are to maintaining the status quo around policing. What do I mean by that? So uh, one of the uh, in, uh, communities in which we did some interviews uh, in Cuyahoga County was Lakewood. And one of the things that people said over and over again about Lakewood is that you know the police are really harsh there. Basically, they're engaged in a project of maintaining boundaries between Cleveland and Lakewood. This is one example. Um, uh, another thing that as this is actually also in Lakewood, but you know, interviewing people in other places, but maybe Lakewood is especially um, just standing out in our uh, data. Uh, I interviewed, um, or we interviewed part of the team, um, a couple there that talked about how their tax dollars were going toward this really great policing in which they had police who would show up for all kinds of things. If there was a power line down, if they had a problem with their neighbors, all of these things that, by the way, are not violence. And so one of the tropes that we have around how important it is to have policing is that that police protect people from violence, but often, in fact, what communities want from police, um, especially wealthy, affluent communities that are kind of dedicated to the status quo, it's not really about violence reduction. It's about having access to a bundle of goods that are, that are kind of an economic distribution and a symbol of wealth, more so than anything about safety. So why is it important to understand that? When we're advocating, uh, on behalf of transforming or ab abolishing these systems, part of the resistance that's going on is not actually about quote unquote safety at all. It's about resources, it's about finances and wealth and understanding that is really critical for our advocacy strategies. But another thing we have to deal with is that in many communities that are most brutalized by policing, um, there is also resistance to ideas like abolition for good reason, for understandable reasons, which is that people are really dealing with safety issues that we have not had a deep uh, committed investment in uh, resolving through other mechanisms. And so this project of imagination, this I love all the arts that are part of this, um, a part of this think tank, but part of the issue is that it's really difficult for any of us, even those of us who, again, have experienced the most marginalization and brutalization through policing, to truly, concretely envision what the alternative is. Why do I talk about this? We know what happened after the summer of 2020 when uh, journalists and, and people who were invested in maintaining the status quo talked to black people in communities about how they felt about con concepts like defund the police. What happened? Uh, well, people were like, no, I don't want to defund the police. Of course this is what people said because, like, uh, of course this is what many black people said, importantly, uh, to be specific about the people. Um, of course this is what people said because we have real concerns and we, that in none of, a, none of our imaginations without active prodding are going to be able to see alternatives and believe in them. So part of the project, and I really enjoy that, you know, thinking about the idea there are people here who are creating these alternatives, making them real, but also opening them up so that other people can see them, see the work, 
including researchers. So that may be the one, <laughs> maybe one of the things that academics um, prov can provide that is really helpful, I think, is writing about alternatives to policing and incarceration and transformative um, regimes. Um, and particularly, social scientists can be helpful in quote unquote evaluating them, of course using metrics that are not, you know, kind of police metrics, <laughs> you know? We have, there's, there's a lot more I can say about that and I won't just in the interest of time. But, but part of what we're up against is just kind of creating these, all, um, creating these imaginations. To be, um, again, more specific about one of the things that I observed in Cleveland in particular. Um, so I published this article in um, 2020 called Located Institutions. Um, it's in the American Journal of Sociology. And one of the, um, uh, and this was based on the, the Cuyahoga County research. And one of the, um, I'd say disturbing. I mean, I didn't call it disturbing in the article um, because it's an academic piece, but I'll say it's disturbing, um, uh, was seeing the bifurcation between people who had not only generalized negative experiences with the police, but who actually reported unjust stopping, people who talked about um, you know, the unjust deaths that they, had, um, they were aware of, people in their communities who were brutalized by the police. But if you ask them about, um, you know, in the same, same conversation, same interview, uh, what do you want for your children? You know, so there's it's one of the respondents talked about wanting her children to know that they could call the police and know that they had um, these institutions to rely upon. Um, viewing, being um, in good with the police as part of, and as, as in the article I view it as you know, part of the American dream, and the way that we believe in home ownership, and the way that we believe in good schools, there's a, deeply embedded cultural narrative that, that is cr cuts across many communities that you want to think the police are good. And so part of the deep project here is creating new ways of thinking and that has to be pathway that, you know, and one that really emphasizes safety as not being a product of policing, but instead a product of all of the things that people in those communities that I talked about at the beginning want, um, resources, right? So, so as we think about safety as really coming from resources and, and really put that narrative forward, that's critical to this project of creating liberation and moving beyond our status quo. I'm gonna stop there, but I'm really, again, happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Monica. That was beautiful. Um, I really am honored and humbled to be on this panel, really excited for this conversation this morning. Um, so I want to talk to you all about the work that we've been doing in Columbus around mental illness and mental health crises and policing and the ways that that causes so much harm in our communities. Um, there's a lot of high profile cases, police murders that have occurred across the country, uh, including Jerron Thomas in Columbus, who was experiencing a mental health crisis, uh, a crisis back in 2017. Police were called and he was beaten, brutalized, lost his life. Um, Daniel Prude in Rochester, New York, very similar experience, um, experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, police killed him. Um, Tanisha Anderson here in Cleveland lost her life in 2014. Very similar mental health crisis experience. And so the current systems are failing people. Um, the overwhelmingly law enforcement police response to people who need support and compassion and empathy is causing people to lose their lives. Not only deaths, violent deaths, but arrests, incarceration, there are huge numbers of people uh, with mental illness, psychiatric disabilities who are incarcerated in the state of Ohio and across the country. And that is a failure of our society, a failure of our systems. And it's not only that too, it's not only our incarceration, incarceration, uh, carceral systems, it's also our mental health systems, which can be very brutal and harmful too. Um, a lot of people who 
are experiencing some type of mental health crisis, if they don't end up brutalized by police or arrested and taken to jail, they're taken to a psychiatric hospital forcibly and locked away for days or weeks or even months and very similar experience to being incarcerated. They may lose their kids or lose their jobs or lose their housing and the trauma of being locked away in a really isolating, traumatic environment like a psychiatric hospital stays with people. Um, so like I said, our systems are failing people and very grateful for uh, the Black Lives Matter protest in the summer of 2020 following the murder of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others opened up so many conversations in the work that we are doing around mental illness. These conversations were just not really happening before. And so very grateful for those protests, all of those, um, all of the organizing and all the hard work that so many people, especially black organizers, put into that, to these movements uh, um, has just created a lot of momentum in this work. Very grateful for that. So um, in Columbus, we're part of Disability Rights Ohio is where I work. We're part of something called the Columbus Safety Collective, uh, which is pushing the city of Columbus to create what are called alternative crisis response systems, which are, we're pushing the city to take police, law enforcement completely out of the equation when someone that is experiencing some type of mental health crisis. And so making a lot of progress, it's a lot of hard work because there are a lot of powerful entrenched interests who want to maintain the status quo. Um, but the most important thing that I've learned in this work is people who are directly impacted by these harms in our, in our society, by these harmful systems, need to be front and center in leading the way in coming up with solutions. So I wanna uplift my friend Angie Williams. She would be cool with me telling her story. Um, she um, is a person with mental illness and a few years ago, four or five years ago, was ex experiencing a mental health crisis and police were called. And she, like the others that I mentioned earlier, um, had a really terrible experience. She didn't lose her life, thankfully. Um, but she was taken to jail. She was beaten up. She was taken to jail. She was taken to a psychiatric hospital. And it still lives with her today. When she talks about it publicly, you can just hear the pain in her voice. And I have learned so much from her about how to approach these conversations and how to approach the advocacy and the organizing. One thing that, that she's said is, there's this narrative, and it's, all, it's often coming from people who want to maintain the status quo and don't want things to change, but it's often, why don't we just train police officers to uh, not brutalize or treat them how to deal with someone who's going through a mental health crisis, which is just not effective. And, and the way that she explains it is, when I'm in crisis and a police officer shows up, even if they're the best trained police officer, even if they're the friendliest person, they still have that authority. They're wearing a police uniform, they have handcuffs, taser, a gun. They have the authority to take me to jail, um, criminally charge me, um, brutalize me, which all of which happened, right? And so it, it's this inherent escal escalation when police are involved in these situations um, that no amount of training is going to change, right? And so really pushing for police to be completely out of the equation and for social workers or peer support specialists to respond to people in mental health crisis. Um, Angie has explained that having someone, it doesn't need to be a trained clinician or a social worker, it could be, so a peer support specialist is basically someone with lived experience with mental illness or mental health crises. Having someone there who can like talk a person or, or help a person feel calmer, more at ease, someone who's been through a similar experience in their life in the past, is that those are the types of outcomes that we want, right? We want people to be safe and not be arrested or brutalized or taken to jail or a psychiatric hospital. So my point is we need to listen to people who are directly impacted by 
harm and oppression in our society, including in these contexts. And um, I should have mentioned this before, but after the, in the summer of 2020, um, many of us were just so inspired by the movement and the organizing and the protest. And those of us who work in the disability rights, disability justice field, um, grateful that there were conversations about police violence and police brutality, but thought that this, thought that mental illness and disability was missing from the public discourse and so wanted to add add that to the public conversation, right? And doing a lot of research, doing a lot of studies and seeing obviously people of color, black folks, indigenous people are disproportionately harmed by police violence. We all know that. Um, but when you add disability or mental illness to the equation, the disproportionality increases even more. And so um, very important conversation and there's a lot of momentum, like I said, and I'm really excited about that. It's really hard work. Um, because these powerful interests, police unions, city council, mayor, and Columbus are, um, just need to be pushed in the right direction and we need organizing, we need movements to push them in the right direction, continue pushing them in the right direction. So, a um, lot more to say, but I'll wrap up for now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Kareem Hinton. Uh, I'm an organizer with the Cleveland chapter of Black Lives Matter Cleveland. Um, <clears throat> I want to start off by um, with something that I coined because I think it's very relevant and it is, and we hear this something similar in reference to law enforcement, but I'm not going that direction and this is what Blessed are the path makers because they make the way. And what I mean by that, or who and what I'm speaking to, are activists. Activists who make a way, and while they're the ones beating down a path, cutting down the vines, cutting through the animals and all the dangers, they are the ones who are the least valued when that path is made. This is when you have others step in and they say, well, I'm an academic. They say, well, I have a nonprofit. They say, others, I have an entire congregation. And these people, they take over and they take over and it doesn't, we call that co-optation. It doesn't go the way that it was intended to go. As an organizer with Black Lives Matter Cleveland, as an activist, I'm one of those people that have had to move because I was a thorn in the side of law enforcement. That's the danger I place myself in. Other activists, well, heck, you know, if you're familiar with an incident that happened yesterday that I was involved in uh, with regards to uh, the city of Cleveland protest, um, protesting, which I'll go into in a short, uh, but protesting something, you know, we took a particular stance. We found ourselves going against um, a mayor who we at one time had advocated for hard decision to make, but we weren't gonna let a relationship stand in the way of what's right. And by making that hard decision, I jokingly said this morning, because I thought about it on the way in, because pretty soon the, my nine to five job is gonna be over in about a year. Okay, it has a shelf life. And I just probably took away three job opportunities for myself with what I did yesterday, going against the uh, city of Cleveland's mayor. And I'm okay with that. That's my job. Working with Black Lives Matter Cleveland, working with grassroots activists, some awesome folks, got some friends here in the audience, love you. Um, 
we weren't, I'm not gonna say that we're the most loved. I'm not gonna say we're the most respected. It started off where no one, no one wanted to work with us. No one wanted to uh, bring us into certain spaces. And what it has evolved into was we made our own space. We made our own community with folks where we all collectively made our own space. And all those folks who weren't getting invited, who weren't being taken seriously, well, we got our own space and we're, and people are taking notice. So this is new territory for me when I find myself being in a position where I'm now being asked, for example, for a local municipality that will remain nameless. Um, they had their collective bargaining agreement with law enforcement. Um, and we were used as a consultant. That's new territory. Not some of your more traditional organizations who have been in doing uh, movement work or advocacy, social justice work, but little old us, we got invited. I feel it's testament to the hard work that we've been doing. I think it's testament to the sacrifice that we've you know, been doing and the fact that we're still here. In movement work, in this work for social justice, in this work for change making, I really feel that that sacrifice, if that part is not really, if, that, if, you, if you're in this for a claim, if you're in this because you have a vendetta, you won't last long. But the fact is that because it's in so many of us, it's in our hearts, we evolve. So Black Lives Matter, we showed up for the deaths of people like Tamir, Tamir Rice. We've shown up for the deaths of people like Luke Stewart and Euclid. We've shown up for these people. We've collaborated with their families. We've loved on those families. And we realized that, and this has nothing to do with the call of folks in the comment section on social media that, you know, um, got to stay away from those. I swear I do. But, uh, you know, you hear, get a job. I know they don't have a job. You hear things like, you know, what about black on black crime? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, it's, if you're involved, if you, if you know, you know. If you're involved, you know. And what many don't realize is that what you see is that many of us show up to advocate and to help these families and these individuals that have suffered a loss or have suffered from the mistreatment of law enforcement. But that's not all that we do. We evolved and we recognize that that change that we need, we can't just achieve that by being a first responder. We can achieve that by thinking ahead because unfortunately the people that we elected in office they don't do that, at least not for our greater good. And so that is the reason why, for example, you had grassroots activists. BLM Cleveland was a part of a coalition of folks who were a part of Citizens for a Safer Cleveland. Citizens for a Safer Cleveland recognize that we can't just keep coming out here asking a mayor, asking our legislators to change laws. We got to change these laws. And so the tireless work of the families who have lost loved ones to police violence, the tireless work of advocates, activists, and even some members of law enforcement were able and legal, brilliant legal minds and other organizers were able to put together and create legislation and put it on the ballot 
that would give us community oversight over police, over their disciplines, but not just a body that would have that and have it uh, that could probably be underfunded because that's what our politicians do when there's something they don't want. They kill it by not funding it. So that's even was put into the, the charter language. It's like, hey, percentage of what the police get is going to be a guarantee uh, or what the police get, a percentage of that amount is going to be guaranteed for this police commission, which is going to keep it operable. So if you go up on what you put into police, you're going up on what you're giving them as well. So we, that's how we know it's going to be funded. It's here. It's not going anywhere. The effort that it's going to take to get it out is, I think, is a, is, would be a Herculean effort that I don't think that they'd be able to do. All of that came from a tremendous amount of forethought. And it has the potential, well, it's unlike anything that's been done anywhere in the country. And it has the potential to really make change here in Cleveland. Unfortunately, we hit a setback. We hit, our setback is that elected officials, their legal personnel have chosen to try to find legal loopholes to limit the power of that body. And we gave that body a lot of power to be able to discipline, the call for investigations, the, uh, the ability to shape policy to create policy for law enforcement. They've taken the opportunity to put some folks in that are in some cases the least connected. In other cases, they just have too cozy of a relationship with people in the administration. But not all of them, some though. And there are also were essential posts that were supposed to be represented by specific people that fit a specific category, like an attorney who has been involved with um, prosecuting police misconduct. They didn't feel that position. And there are other positions they didn't feel, and I don't want to get too far into that. And that's why we have a problem with it. So now, here it is, we go back to the drawing board at trying to make them do what it is that needs to be done. Hence, or that which is why the first thing we did was we saw that it was going to be a PR moment yesterday and we wanted to take away from that PR moment that they were going to have to try to say, hey, look what we're doing, we're doing great things. And we had to make it known that you're not doing great things, you're not doing things in the spirit of what we agreed to and you're trying to undermine what its original intent was. And so. That's why I find myself now having to, re, having to figure out where the heck I'm going to work in about a year. But again, I'm okay with that. Um, I'm going to close up and, you know, well, give me a couple more minutes. So here's the thing. As I was speaking about evolving, like we talked about the legislative part, but the other part that I want to get into is that in our forethought, we are now we could, I'll say, in the labs. And we're working on programs because we recognize something. While we have a city that says we need more surveillance, like they invested, uh, they're investing a bunch of money into ShotSpotter. And so ShotSpotter is gonna be, it's a series of microphones that are also connected with some cameras that are around the city. And if they hear what they consider to be a gunshot, they say, well, we know we're going to disperse law enforcement into those areas. We've had long had a problem with that because we acknowledge that this leads to a high tech stop and frisk. So anywhere where they hear a gunshot, police are dispatched to that area. And if you happen to be walking through that area, you can be stopped. And the pretense will be because of shot spotter. That's a problem. We find ourselves in, the, in these positions because we have a very lazy 
group of elected officials that are looking for the next big thing, looking for the next quick fix, looking for the thing that makes them appear to be proactive. What we know is that rather than dealing with someone who might be causing some type of problem or discomfort in our community is not to throw them in jail. We know that let's get to those root issues. But I'm going to take it, but now we're at the point where we've got a lot of great folks that are looking into mental health and we're like, hey, keep doing what you're doing. We're now getting into programming because we want to deal with the young people so that if we start, just say for example, in our schools, start with the fourth grade. As that generation of children gets older and they progress through the school systems or just get older and progress through life, what we essentially would be able to do with the right teaching, with the right programming is we will not have, we will have created a frontline generation of change and they will not replace the folks who die, go to prison, or age out, who, who age out and just say, you know what, I want to be mature and I'm not going to do the things in the community that are detrimental anymore. And what we've essentially done is created a better community. Our elected officials aren't thinking like this, so we have to do it for them. We have to be the ones to try to get this programming in the schools. And the reason that this is in our heads is because of the lived experiences, because of the tireless work that we do, understanding the outcomes, and because of the fact that we know that if we're going to get any real change, we have to do something radical. And so now I'm about to close. And so with that said, I ask that with some of the folks here, with the positions that you're in, the things that you do, work with the folks who are ground level because the folks that are ground level, boots on the ground, they're living that experience as we speak. They have perspectives. They want to make that change. And the way not to do it is the way that we see it being done when we have a very progressive mayor or allegedly progressive mayor in the city of Cleveland who then hires on and brings on a lot of folks, some great minds. But those great minds, when left to their own devices, fall very short because they don't have the affected people a part of that administration to help advise or complement the work that they would be able to do. We can't recreate that in our different agencies, organizations, nonprofits, and so forth. So um, with that being said, I'm just going to close, but I had to give that PSA, that public service announcement, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, we're ready for questions. Um, we're going to use mics, Councilman, if that's OK. I'll remind you, uh, please do your best to keep your questions succinct. And let me, let me just make my announcement, okay. Councilman. Thank you. Uh, for everybody else in the room, please keep your questions succinct as best as you can. Direct it to a panelist uh, if there's a specific panelist that you'd like to answer the question. Uh, and we can line up here at this microphone. Don't be shy. I'll also say while we're mulling about uh, or uh, if you want to stretch your legs and make your way over to the art station while we're doing question and answer, please feel free to do that uh, and do it throughout today's events. Um, there's nothing on the on the canvas yet, so I'm a little eager to see what we do. Okay, Councilman, thank you for your patience. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kareem Hunt. Thank you for what His you last said. Meal I was listening very attentively. And a strawberry what shake. I wanted to ask you is. Uh, I'm a councilman in the city of East Cleveland. I've been there for over 25 years now. And uh, what we did a few weeks ago, we collaborated with Black on Black to work with our police department. And what I'm feeling, and I feel your sincerity, is that 
We've got to work together in a lot of these situations. All council people don't have hidden agendas or don't want to do what the people do. Most of them do. All of us have our imperfections and, and, we, and, we, and, we, and, we, and it's a learning process. I believe that if we come together, reach agreements, just like the courage that you showed yesterday with Mayor Bibbs in Cleveland. Well, we had a situation about eight years ago in, in Cleveland where the police came from Cleveland, shot up in East Cleveland, shot some people 137 times. We've been protesting that for years. Okay, but you're gonna always have elected officials. Hopefully you have good elected officials, but they have a role to play. I'm reaching out to you to say that how do we bring the players, the ground people, to come together so they work with the, the elected officials, whatever you want to call them, the mayors and all like that. Bibbs is a new guy. He's a young guy. But we have to work with him. We put him in there. Okay. Government is not going anywhere. It's going to always be there. So I want to hear from all of you about that. Thank you. So let me start off by saying this, that any elected official that has ever approached me about doing some work, we have a discussion, and if they sincerely and legitimately want to collaborate and not look legitimate by being in close association, I'm here for it. And so what I then do is how, ask, how do you want my assistance, what is the goal, and what are you willing to give? Because unfortunately, we have too many elected officials that would be more concerned about keeping their job, and so therefore what happens is the product that you collaborate on and put out becomes compromised or cast to the side, compromised, diluted, or cast to the side because if they push too hard, and I had this said to me by a city council person, they, this city council person, and I have a bad habit of mimicking people's voices when I'm quoting them, so I'm not gonna do it because you'd know who it was. <laughs> but I had this council person say, oh, Kareem, I really was with what you guys are saying, and I'm, I, I agree with you guys wholeheartedly, but if I don't back this, that the council president is pushing forth, what's gonna happen is they're going to make sure that this area that I need new sidewalks and curbs done, it's not gonna get that funding. And what we need, and so what I say to that politician who might be fearful of something like that is stop playing that game and expose their butts. Say, hey, to the community, I'm fighting for you and I want change, but hey, I'm trying to do the right thing, but I, this is what I'm being threatened with, and these are the people who are threatening me with that. So that then there can be a collective to either get them to make some change or get their butts out of office. If you're not an elected official that's willing to do that when things get rough, then we're just having a camera moment. And, I, and, and, and I've been through enough of those camera moments and I've done too much free consulting for you know elected officials that if they're not willing to make the same sacrifice that I make every day, you know, then there's no point in us really doing anything outside of a collaboration of just saying, you know, you taking the, uh, the torch when we pass the torch to you for the change that we've gotten started. And you just take it and run with it and use us as your, 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 your consultants and use us as that example that you need when you look back to the community and say, these are the folks that want this and we're there for you in that way, but real close collaboration takes sacrifice on all ends and that's something that we don't get a lot. And I'm sorry I got long-winded on that. 
I agree with what you say, and I agree with what Bell and the other gentleman, sorry, missed your name, Kevin. but Truett, okay, thank you. Um, in the whole situation of the government of each city's, uh, some cities have been able to uh, change in regards to the police regarding mental illness. Some cities have been able to change in regards to how they train their police. Um, the biggest problem in this city happens to be the union. If you cannot come up with a way to redo, I'm not talking about abolish the union, the police union, but if you don't come up with a way to redo it so you can work with them, those changes that you're trying to put forth will not come to fruition. And like you said about politicians and making sacrifices, some that's the only job and the only power they ever had. So they'll sacrifice other things in order to enjoy that. There are politicians that know how to work within the system so that they can get with what they want for their communities and not lose anything against their community, so to speak. The only problem is people are not running, running for those positions. So you're getting people that are likable, that are chosen. They don't know how to operate in the system and they fall short or they follow the trend. The quick pro quo, I'll give you this, you get this. So my thing is, after living on this planet for a while, I've seen all these things come around and it's been about 70 decades, or excuse me, seven. The whole situation is, you're gonna have to attack one thing and that's the biggest thing, because you can put the Band-Aid on mental health. You can put the Band-Aid on changing how police are violent. But you have to remember, this society was created on violence. Police were only used to eradicate coming back from slavery. How else can you control people unless you use violence? Yes, police can't be trained. In other countries, they have to go, to go to college four years, and they study social, psychological situations before they can become police officers. Here, you can't attack it from that part. You're gonna have to start from the beginning, and I have to, from the end. From the point of what Martin Luther King said later after realizing that protesting and turning the other cheek wasn't working, sometimes you just have to burn things down and rebuild. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is to uh, Kevin in, in particular. Uh, before we started, I was speaking with one of the participants here, and she was talking about the fact that when families take children in rather than going through the adoption system and all of that, uh, they are paid from the social service system, I guess, $14 a month to feed a child. Uh, the question and the issue that I'm dealing with is for people who are on the cognitive mental spectrum who need to be on SSI, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I think about what is happening now culturally, politically, this country is not too far away from the fascist or Nazis solution. Yes. 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 And so the question is, what specific agencies should someone approach in terms of getting someone 
uh, on the spectrum onto SSI. Uh, I appreciate your comments and your question. Um, just generally, I think you mean the autism spectrum, right? Or just a, a person with mental health disabilities. Um, yeah, it, it depends on the, the diagnosis. There's a state agency called the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities that would include um, services and programs for people who are autistic or have developmental disabilities. There's also the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for like mental health diagnoses. Uh, in terms of applying for Social Security, that's done through a federal agency, the Social Security Administration. Um, so there, there are definitely programs and services out there for people with mental disabilities. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really important point. Even when you're found eligible for Social Security benefits, which if you're not initially approved, it can of, of often take years to fight the system and finally get eligible. Once you're eligible for, for benefits, you're still on fixed income and still living in poverty, even with that income, right? And so I, I think that question ties into this broader conversation about policing and prisons and jails, right? Because we invest so much in those punitive systems, right? Instead of investing in Social Security, Social Security benefits or affordable housing or mental health care, mental health treatment, things like that. In the city of Columbus, I'm sure this is true in Cleveland and pretty much every other city or close to it. The city of Columbus, we spend a third of our city budget on police and while people are going without housing and are going without food, literally, right, in mental health care, mental health treatment. And so we're investing in things that are punitive and harmful instead of investing in things that people need to stay alive and to be healthy and safe. So I'm glad you, you brought that up. That's a really important part of the, part of the conversation. Thank you. We can talk more afterwards if you want. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Gabriella Celeste. I'm with the Schubert Center for Child Studies here at Case. Um, and I really appreciate what all of you bring today. Um, Kevin, I want to just say we work with some of your attorneys who are working with kids in the detention center here, and yeah. we're really grateful for that work. Um, you know, uh, Kareem, your courage and holding us all accountable, something that you continue to help me grow and help us inform the work that we're trying to do with young people and avoiding their involvement in the criminal justice system. And Ms. Bell, I really appreciate your research and, and particularly the fact that you, we've got the benefit of you having spent time here in Cuyahoga County to help us reflect on some of this, you know, where we need to be going. And I guess what I, that leads to my question, and one of the people you didn't mention, Kevin, um, uh, Kareem mentioned Tamir, which is what got certainly our organization more engaged in how do we prevent and do kids from even having to have to interact with police, but where they are interacting, how do we actually get our police to understand that kids are different and kids require special protections. Um, I think about Makia Bryant and what happened in Columbus. That got us as an organization to be thinking much more about a very different response for kids in crisis. Um, and you know, the, the fact, uh, you know, when you mentioned um, Ms. Bell, that people are saying, all we have is 911. That's who we call. You know, and many of our families, they don't know that they're, we need other options, not that they don't know. We haven't created those other options. So if you could talk, all of you, but each of you bringing your different kind of experience, thinking about our young people in particular and how they're, they are um, more at risk, our black and brown kids are more at risk of police violence, um, and they are less supported, and we are creating this pipeline directly for them to end up in this horrific mass incarceration system. What should we be doing as a community to be better protecting our young people? Um, and I'll leave it for, that, for you to respond. So if I could start. Um, I kind of was leading into this, um, speaking on this a bit generally, but I think that the biggest, biggest investment in our futures and our children's futures comes in us putting the time and, and efforts, the money, and the programming into the schools. That's where it starts. We had a gun violence um, summit uh, for the youth um, recently and one of the biggest takeaways that we got from that 
you know, when folks were reaching out, speaking about things that they went through and so forth, and they were, um, because we had some folks who worked in mental health present, and they said, we have programs for that, and though they're available to, 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 to students, but the students didn't know about them. Why don't the students know about them? Because unlike when I was younger, where we had more counselors in the schools, where we had teachers that, you know, were supported a lot better. And so therefore, their, their word meant something. And because their word meant something and they were valued more, they did more for our kids. They did more for me. So my mother was able to work three jobs and I was a latchkey kid in the first grade, but I was okay because I had great teachers. Mm -hmm. We need more of that, but we don't, those kids don't have the counselors, but if we were to actually put programming in our schools that is mandatory across the board for everyone, conflict resolution, we would essentially teach our children how to resolve things, not only between themselves, their peers in school and in the neighborhood, but actually it goes into police because they then, when you have an over-aggressive law enforcement officer, they become the adult in the room and they de-escalate that cop. That's a skill that we give them by creating that type of programming. We need to teach them about rape culture. Over, well, last that I checked, and I haven't checked in a while, but last that I checked, over 35% of the women who find themselves in the criminal justice system have been sexually assaulted. These women also suffer from PTSD and other forms of mental health issues and so much of it comes from how they were affected when they were in that situation when they were sexually assaulted. I think about us having something that addresses rape culture in schools so that young people understand in the same way that for me to sign a legal contract and it is not binding if I'm under the influence, nor is it permissible, nor is it right for a young lady or a young person to give consent regarding sexual relations and such if they're under the influence. So, cause, because we need to take away that culture of greasing the wheels, somebody being under the influence, hey, let's have fun, and then think that it's okay then to make advances on them. Those things still happen. I grew up in a culture that thought that that was okay, and I don't think anything has changed since. We gotta save our kids. We have to, so it might seem real simple, but I'm telling you, we'd save a lot of folks. There are a lot of things that we could and should be doing in our schools, and if we did, we'd be making a huge, huge change that would spill over into our communities, and we'd be dealing with a lot less of the issues that we're currently dealing with. So I just wanted to say, I think that, you know, we need to start in our schools, and how do we do that? advocate for these things in our schools and I think that the first step is at least here locally in Cleveland advocate for an elected school board mm -hmm. yes, so um, I'll I'll add a little bit to that I th really thank you for that comment I think what we do in the schools is really important but I will say in addition to that when I think about what the greatest case for an abolitionist approach to advocacy is is actually children and one of the biggest issues is that police and many people in the private community and I'll say a little bit more about that do not see black and brown children as children right this is precisely what we saw in the case of Tamir this you know, I think about this a lot I have a nephew who's 14 years old and I know what people think of when they see him um, uh, they think he looks like an adult, but he is like really a child, right? He's like an immature 14-year-old. And, um, and I worry about 
every day him running into the wrong person who will see him as an adult instead of a child and that is a and that's a that's a problem of white supremacy in a very particular way so it of course reminds me of what um, the comment, uh, the um, commentator said earlier, the one that we didn't um, get a chance to to engage with. Um, there does have to be a dismantling and an action, like a big case for shrinking the role of policing in schools also, in particular, right? So this whole like kind of school resource officer, let's use a policing approach to discipline problems is one that has to end because it inevitably places black and brown children at risk. Um, and so, but we also have to deal with this as an issue among private people in general. So who calls police on, on kids? It's, in, it's people who see them as adults and not children. And then, then the inevitable sort of happens. So we have a lot of work to do in dismantling the adultification of black and brown children in ways that I don't know that we can train our way out of with respect to policing. Uh, thank you, Kareem and Monica. Um, very briefly, uh, I appreciate that you uplifted Micaiah Bryant. For those of you who don't know, 16-year-old um, black child who was uh, shot and killed by Columbus police uh, last year. Very tragic uh, situation, huge protest in Columbus. Um, and I think it's important to examine the broader uh, problems in our society that led up to that police encounter, right? Like, Micaiah Bryant was in the foster care system, and um, she was, she had multiple placements. She, she had been living at the time of her death in a foster care placement, right? And it, each new placement that she has, like, this is a kid, and going from placement to placement, having that instability in a kid's life can be really, really harmful and traumatic. And I remember reading about Micaiah Bryant and her life after she was murdered. And at some point in her life, she was living with her grandmother. And it was a relatively stable situation for her. She was still struggling in some ways. But um, her grandmother was in a situation where she couldn't pay rent. And... Um, lost her housing, and then Micaiah Bryant was moved out of that home, moved into another foster care placement, where if we had just, as a society, intervened at that moment and helped the grandmother pay rent, Micaiah Bryant could have stayed with her extended family, and maybe she'd still be alive today. So examining not only like the police violence, but the broader ways in which systems, like the foster care system, our failing kids, that's a really important part of the conversation too. So thank you for bringing up Micaiah Bryant. I really appreciate that. Hello everyone, um, happy Saturday. My name is Danielle Rashid. I am a City of Cleveland employee. Um, <laughs> I am the daughter of the great Yvonne Pointer, so I have been living this life um, for a very long time. I um, just wanna thank you for saying what children need to be doing. I had D.A.R.E. in school, I had bags in school, and I really want to say that parents, I'm a parent advocate for the CMSD, um, I really want to say that it starts at home a little bit. And if you have parents that can tell other parents about children um, being aware, I, my mother made me aware of what my surroundings were on the way to school. Um, my daughter really doesn't think that danger is imminent, you know, because I protected her so well in her mind, but um, she's in high school. She goes to Cleveland School of the Arts in this neighborhood. Um, I've had to say, hey, you're in the ninth grade. You may have to get on the health line to go home now. And she's like, I'm getting on the bus? You know, like, oh my goodness. You know, like, is the bus safe? In her mind, the first question she had was, is the bus safe? And just turn your location on, talk to me, um, FaceTime me on your way home, and I'll make sure you you get there, but also with the several policing um, units that are around here, we have uh, University Circle Police, we have Cleveland Police, we have uh, Cleveland Heights Police, we have all of these policing, and there should be programming in the school that involves police coming to the school, coffee with police. Um, something, I, like I said, Saturday institutions, the, there should be a group like this for youth 
not just adults that we have to take this information back to the youth, but something my daughter has a um, grassroots organization. It's called Blanket Blessings, where she gives back to the homeless on her birthday. But this is something that I have instilled in her since she was a young child to be aware of her surroundings. And if more parents can take that to their children, hey, and I'm not saying that some people have five and six kids. They have to be to work at 5.30. They have to work three jobs. But if the parents can say, hey, there's a, there's a Saturday class at the school, and the police are going to be there, and you can take your concerns to them, and you don't have to be, seem as a threat as a 14-year-old boy or a passionate 14-year-old girl who speaks up and speaks out, and you don't see that as rude or disrespectful, that you can um, be heard. There shouldn't be an age limit in that you can be heard. So I think that um, more programming with police actually involved, not um, talking about them, and we have to take it back to them. They should be here, they should be listening, and they should be um, sur surrounding more of our school systems. There's four different police units within two mile radius of where we're standing, and they should be, there should be more of a protection within the within our cities and within the neighborhoods. So um, I feel like if they could use some of that money that they're doing, I don't know, I don't know statistics all, all that well, but if they can use some of that money to do more community policing, a lot of other cities have community policing where a police rise up to them and say, hey, how you doing? Um, not to be afraid, not to say, oh, do you need a ride home or do you need me to call your parent or something of the sort. So that way children feel more safe. Um, in, in this neighborhood or in the city of Cleveland. Children feel more safe addressing the police, calling the police, looking for them for help. My daughter has to go to a college campus. I hope that she is aware of her surroundings walking on a large college campus and seeing that the police can help you, not dismiss you because you're a black and brown child and you're not a, a white child that they think only needs protection of some sort and that you don't have to be afraid of the culture, of rape culture, um, getting back to your dorm of some sort and that there is police protection. So I just think that if more programming is involved with, like I said, we had DARE, we had BAGS, people probably don't know what that is, it was on West 25th. <laughs> um, I just think that there needs to be more programming involved and inside of the schools, like you said. Um, and also for parents to make sure that they are talking to their children every single day about protection and how to be aware to protect themselves. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say something. I'll say something really quickly in response to that because I really respect and understand um, what it's like to be a parent. I mean, I don't understand what it's like to be a parent because I'm not a parent, but I do know how much parents are up against in terms of protecting their kids. And um, you know, I think one of the things that makes all of this really complicated is that. Um, you know, sometimes people have positive experiences with the police. It's exactly like I was, you know, talking about they have there's this kind of complex layer in which sometimes the police protect you, but then there's also this much greater sort of structural risk. And I think one of the things one of the things that's really important for me as someone who tries who tries to be an advocate is to take seriously people's individual experiences, what people are up against, et cetera, while also speaking truth to power about the structures people are up against as well. So yes, parents have to have an obligation to um, help their children understand the world around them. But at the same time, that's not what justice looks like, in my opinion. Like, in my opinion. In my opinion, justice has to also mean creating structural responses so we don't so the police aren't all your daughter has to rely on, right? And so like that, that is what I hope the type of conversation we're having is today in which we can hold all of that complexity together at the same time. What uh, I just want to add to that, and I knew you were going to get deep like that, that's why I, let, I, I wanted you to go first. You, I'm with you. Um, what I'll add to that quite simply is uh, two things. One, that law enforcement, before I can trust them to interact with my child, they have to first own their wrongdoing and begin the process of fixing and healing themselves first and foremost before I can expect to rely on them for anything. Secondly, the understanding I think that we really need to have with regards to the onus of parents for their children is that 
especially here in Cleveland, our school systems failed children long ago. Those children are now adults, and they have raised children. So these broken people have raised broken people, and those broken people have raised more broken people. And so therefore, they, many of them lack the skills and the ability to function, to raise functioning adults or for raise functioning children into adults the way that we would want and like for them to be. I can't put the total onus on these young people and I can't put the total onus on these parents. There's a shared onus and it's going to and it's not going to happen overnight and that's why we looked at it from the perspective of let's start with a frontline generation and we'll just work our way, you know. But I just I just kind of had to say that because there is a shared onus and it's not just on the parents. Did you have something? Yeah. Um, I just want to say that we pivot to our next um, uh, performance at 1130. So those in line, just be mindful of the time if you can. Thank you. I remember back in the day, and I'm 76 years old, you knew who the policemen were patrolling your area. And that's one of the major differences. They know you, they know your mother, they know your grandmother. So if you were as a young man somewhere, they would say your grandmother know you're doing this or whatever. And so now we have policemen in our area that are detached and don't understand the background of the people. And I'm not just talking about in black neighborhoods. I'm talking about in neighborhoods. When we were children, part of our roles was being teachers and being policemen. You know, and just like she said, there were activities back in the day in the Cedar area. There was the Y, there was Phyllis Sweetly, there were pool halls, there were skate rinks, there were shows and stuff. There were things and activities for us to do as children. The kids nowadays, especially in the inner city, we don't have that anymore to some expend some of that energy. People always want to blame the parents. Just like you say, they come sometimes from dysfunctional attitudes. People want to say the young men in jail don't have a father, so what? What it is in the black community, we don't have positive black men in the inner city because back in the day, many times people weren't, did not have a father that were raised. Look at the Stoke brothers and look what they became. So that's a weak excuse because there's no man in the house that you cannot be successful. But what's in the neighborhood, you had a uncle, a grandfather, or, or a neighbor that would teach you how to put two pieces of wood together, <coughs> repair a car you had some kind of positive male image in your neighborhood and just like to say the why was right you know right down the street from where I live where you learned to swim play ping pong you had a lot of uh, activities and stuff like this I think I have one child or daughter I am so grateful I do not have a son most of my girlfriends do have sons but I think about now about if you have a black male son, you're afraid about what's going to happen if they're driving their car and they have seen on the news where people have PhDs by driving black. It makes you almost afraid you black and you are male. You're in danger. So the world has really, really changed and we don't have the positive images that we had because we used to like the police. But it's not only the white cops because I have seen a situation when you're talking about mental illness and I was in the Colonial Arcade. The lady had a store. I knew her brother. I was a technology major. He was highly intelligent, but he had mental illness. Five or six cops put him on the floor, put their knee on them. And I'm talking about back in the 70s. And, and you could tell that he was a weak person, and you could recognize that he had mental illness. But it just seemed like this adrenaline rush where I lived that Ansel Superior. Like when he talked to 137 shots, people lay up in the cut because of the school right there. When they see, when they're laid up in the cut, and they see cars going down, the next thing you know, they done zipped out from what they were doing with this adrenaline rush flying be, you know, behind them. So it's just something like something just happens when they see a high speed thing, and they're supposed to change the laws where all these cars from all these different districts cannot. But it's just something like they think they're on TV or, or something snaps in their mind, you know, because they have like a boring thing. They're sitting all day waiting up for people to go two miles past the hour because two schools right there. 
So it's a mentality, and it's just not it's not just, just the white cops. It's the black cops, too, because I've heard them holding conversations about what they would do and how they felt, and they live out in the suburbs, that they kind of have a mental attitude about those people down there, and automatically everybody's a criminal. And then, like you said, if you're a large, if you're a larger child, they automatically assume that you're an adult. So I wish people stopped blaming the parents because look at the Stokes brothers and the environment they came from. You have to have somebody positive. And I want to say one more thing, what you're saying about teachers. I had problems at home with my parents, but the teachers in school, in junior high and high school, recognized that I had a problem. Okay, but so they helped me. But the thing is, is that sometimes that one person, that one teacher makes a difference because they cared. Thank you. I'm Jan Ridgway, and I am one of the mayor's appointments to the new Cleveland Police Commission. I stood on the steps of City Hall yesterday as we were introduced by Mayor Bibbs to the community, and I respect each person's position that sits on that stage today. I would like to say that in order for a community to change, it takes the collective energy of lots of people. Yes. It takes the researcher. Yes. I am a researcher. It takes the nonprofit. I am a nonprofit. It takes someone involved with mental health and disabilities. I work with those communities. When we went into Garden Valley, which was just recently named again one of the most dangerous communities in the city of Cleveland, that was something I chose to do personally. We have been there 13 years without one dollar from government. We paid out of our pockets to work with that community. We provided food for Tamir Rice's mother. We have worked with every person in this city who has been affected by police brutality. We have put together uh, situations where our children can sit at a table with new police cadets and eat with them to somehow remove the stigma that's associated uh, by our young people with police, but also by police with our young people. Every new police cadet that has graduated in the last four or five years have come through Garden Valley and met, uh, and, and, and we created an opportunity for them to talk to the people we serve on a regular basis. We built the largest food pantry in Northeast Ohio, serving over 30,000 people a month. We work with kids from K through six, specifically on what you're talking about. So see, sometimes we may not personally have been affected by police brutality or violence, but we have worked directly with the people who have. And sometimes we need to broaden our perspective about what is a lived experience. Because a lived experience isn't always whether I have been put in jail, though my brother was. The lived experience may not be that I don't have a mental disability, but I have worked with people and I have had an uncle and a cousin who have been admitted to a psychiatric institute. I have a nephew who has written with the shaft department at night when they are called to situations that may reflect uh, people with mental disabilities. He rides out to do that assessment to make sure that they are not sent to a psychiatric, uh, psychiatric institute or jailed. I guess my question would be, do you not see that there is the opportunity to transform a neighborhood or a community or a city that is rife with police brutality? by bringing together the collective energy of all of us. Mm -hmm. The fact that something originates with the group does not mean that that is the only group that, that can affect change. You need the collective energy of all of us. So I would ask each of you to briefly say whether you think that we have to work individually because we created this, we were the genesis for this, or do you believe that by bringing together those of us who you think may not have lived experiences, do you not think that we have a place at that table too? Okay. 
So I do totally agree. And actually, I did take comfort in knowing that you were up there as well, just so you know that. But uh, being that I am one of the individuals that pulled the petitions, being that so I've been involved with this from the onset, understanding what the intentions were with regards to that language, that more so is what we've been speaking to. We've been speaking to the fact that it's less about who's on there and more about who's not on there. That's where our problems are. There are certain portions that are supposed to be represented on there that are not or they are loosely represented. And we have a problem with that. And so that's where we're at. I do agree with you and hence what I said earlier in regards to collaborations and not forgetting where it came from, being in community with those folks and also having those folks be, be involved. Because when I listened to the mayor say, yes, say yesterday when he was introducing folks and introducing uh, them in ways in which I don't think was very um, accurate. I was a community elder. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, 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 and so to loosely use the term or attribute activism to some folks who are not activists, I find that problematic. But what that does is give legitimacy to everyone there so we can, so that it can be said, I got some boots on the ground activists in there too. No, they're not. Thank you. I, I didn't catch your name, ma'am. I, I, nice to meet you. Um, I, I really appreciate and respect your, your comments and agree with what you were saying that this does need to be a, a collective effort. Um, we all come to these conversations with different life experiences and perspectives and views, and I think that's really healthy um, when people are engaged and, and um, part of the conversation and coming from different angles. So I, I totally agree with you that this does need to be a, a collective effort where people are feel safe sharing and being part of the solution because um, we all have our own experiences and our own perspectives and it's important to hear from others, right, who have had different experiences and different perspectives. So I, I agree with you and I appreciate your point a lot. Okay, we have three more questions and I'm sure we're getting closer to 1130. I'll make it quick and thank you to whoever moved the mic down for me because I'm very short. Um, Miss Bell, it's an honor to hear you speak um, and Mr. Henton, I just want to say that I really appreciate you bringing up specifically the school programming and prevention programming. Um, my question I think is specifically for Mr. Truitt but I'm welcome to any responses. Um, my name's Marcy, I've been working in community mental health for about a decade here in Cleveland, primarily in the Ansel um, St. Clair Superior neighborhood at Wilson School specifically and um, I recently transitioned into a position at CMSD about two months ago and uh, there are lots of program programs that are popping up in Ohio as far as mental health there's the Ohio rise program there's 988 which is an alternative to calling 911 um, there's this CANS assessment which is like a general assessment that anyone can get to be connected with mental health services um, there's the MRSS program which is a mobile response and stabilization service which is separate from uh, insurance it's not insurance based and this is also wonderful but um, I'm very uh, worried about what's happening in Ohio right now, that we're really teetering on the edge of going the way of Texas or Florida, where they want to cut out any mention of SEL um, in our schools, uh, any sort of cultural or racial knowledge or programming, any sort of um, identity or relationship prevention program programming. So I was wondering if you had any insight into that because um, we're really trying to increase the amount of programming in CMSD right now and advocate for the kids and families needs but I feel like in Ohio in the state right now we're in a really dangerous place and I'm not sure if you have any insight coming from Columbus. Yeah um, I appreciate that I share your fears and concerns about the direction Ohio is moving in on some issues. So you, you did mention some like positive things 
Ohio Rise is a new Medicaid program for kids with behavioral health needs, which is moving in the right direction. These are like more services and supports for kids, but not going to solve every problem right for kids, but moving in the right direction. Same with 988, which if you haven't heard, it's an alternative to calling 911 if you're having some type of mental health crisis. Um, that's also moving in the right direction. That's still in many ways and many programs across the state is going to be there's still the risk that police will get involved. So it's it's not a perfect system, but it's moving in the right direction. Um, and, and I see that as like um, positive, right? Not going to solve every problem, but moving in the right direction. Uh, in terms of like, I think you're talking about uh, legislative bills where prohibiting like critical race theory from being taught in schools and um, the don't say gay bill. I think it's the same bill now very, very concerned about that. I think that's so harmful to kids and to our communities, and I'm scared, too. It, it feels like it's erasing our history, and um, yeah, I don't... It, it's scary, and um, I, I, don't, I don't know if either of you have thoughts on this, but... Um, I, I hate the, the it, it feels like a a reaction to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and all, all the progress that we're making, the, the conversations that we're having around sy systemic racism and policing and incarceration. It feels like this negative reaction or a blowback that's now happening from like right wing circles, right? And, and it's scary. Um, so yeah, it, I, I share your fears and concerns about it. I'll add on something really quickly that I hope will be an encouragement. One of the things we do understand from critical race theory is that this type of retrenchment is inevitable. Like this always happens throughout history. And so the arc is, is, is it's all about that, you know, arc of the universe being long but bending toward justice. This had to happen, right? So that so you can press on with your work because this is just part of how you know you're making progress actually. I'll add to that if I can briefly. Um, a friend of mine, we were having, we were talking about these issues, these legislative bills, and he remarked to me, and this has stuck with me, he didn't learn a lot of things in school. He learned it on his own from like other radical people in his life. And so, um, yes, it's very, very harmful, but like, and I had the same experience. Like I. I was pretty clueless as a kid and, and young adult until like I started reading radical stuff and that's how I became radicalized, right? So um, that, that gives me some hope too, that things are already bad for kids in schools and yes, this would make things worse, but um, there are other ways to connect to kids and um, have important conversations like about our country's history and those types of things. So just wanted to add that. Thank you, panelists. Um, my thought is about accountability, circling back on the policing issue and direct repercussions for the actions of police. And my question is this, what is being done to ensure that the union is taxed penalize and lawsuits brought against the unions of the police instead of the cities. The reason why I say that is because people, uh, police officers can kill and still retire with their full pension. I don't understand that. So um, I need to know if there are efforts to go after the people so that they can police themselves because it's, it would be, uh, in my mind, it's a, quite different if we're all in this pot and the lawsuits begin to attack that pot because if, the, if you keep going for the city, there, there's no repercussions for the officers to clean house. Thank you. So um, there are some groups that are working in that direction, trying to end qualified immunity, uh, trying to uh, regulate police unions in regards to donations or, co or financial contributions that they can make, for example, no contributions to judges, because we know that that can actually influence the judge, um, you know, things of that nature. 
Um, so that is being done, but unfortunately you have a lot of folks who are unwilling to tackle certain things. So like, for example, this may resonate with some folks here because I know that uh, social workers, for example, um, have benefit or at, at least in when they work in certain fee, uh, areas or agencies, they have what they call like qualified immunity. So if a bad thing happens in regards to a case, that social worker is not going to be convicted regardless of the fact that they may have been negligent, negligent and that there was something they could have done to save that child that suffered, you know, that died. So, and I just give that as one example. So when you start talking about attacking qualified immunity, other people start to look at, this might mess with me. And so you have a lot less folks that are willing to deal with that. We have an issue, we've been looking into things with the, uh, with um, the collective bargaining agreement that law enforcement has, and we were looking at arbitrators and the binding in the arbitration process, binding arbitration that whatever they say, that is binding so they can overrule any decision that the city makes or any decision that the chief of police makes or the public safety director makes. Binding arbitration. We want to challenge that. We talked about folks about helping us muster some resources and some folks to help us challenge this. And we were shot down by the org because they said, you know, we're pro-union. And we like how that binding arbitration works. So just think about that. If they're, they're more concerned about workspace issues and how it might affect them more than they are about lives being lost and actually affecting that change. And so I'm just sharing that with you. These are the hurdles that we're dealing with. We try to, an organization like the one I'm a part of, in all honesty, we got billions and billions of great ideas but we don't have the capacity to see them all through and we don't have the finances to pay somebody to help us see them all through. Uh, I will try and be quick because I know it's 1137. Uh, so uh, Professor Bell, I uh, want to make sure that I, I heard you right. I believe you were speaking earlier about a, a dearth of imagination around community safety and you know how we live in our communities and uh, I you know I want to ask you in, in, in all this research that you're doing around this and, and the you know the conversations that you're having in the community um, you know understanding that you know the government of this nation state uh, has at its root at, at its foundations, uh, genocide and slavery, and that this is this is baked into our nation state. That you know to the point that uh, you know we have a far right party, and we have a center right party, and we are led to believe that that is the entire political spectrum in the United States. And I believe, especially in Cuyahoga County, the the Democratic Party of Chantel Brown, of Armin Budish, of Bill Mason, Armin Budish's executive assistant, is very much a center-right party. In all these conversations and all this research, um, how much talk is there around uh, reimagining not just community safety, but community democracy uh, you know in in a nation state where I think it really does not exist uh, where we we take all of our responsibility in our communities and we put that in all these apparatuses of government that does not really represent us thank you for that really important point and I will be uh, very quick um, in my response but but in hopes that, that there, I mean, knowing that there's a lot more to say. So in, in the research, um, yeah, what you see over and over again is, that you, you know, you ask people about what it means to participate and the idea is very limited, right? Because we have learned over generations that, you know, voting between two parties is the way to participate. But, um, but it actually invites, you know, I'm kind of coming back to what you were saying earlier, um, the council member here about the community and how to bring people in the community in, one of the failures, I think, of that way of thinking um, is that 
actually there has to be a reason for people in the community to be in right like there has to be real change that people can touch and feel that happens as a consequence of engaging with these apparatuses and that's too often what we don't see and therefore we see that lack of participation quote unquote lack of participation over and over again and an overlooking what people are actually doing in their communities to build safety in a transformed democracy right now so what we need are people who um, see the problem of democracy and transforming democracy as being critical to their project. And what that means is being part, kind of, kind of as we were talking about earlier, and I know the directly affected language can get complicated, but this is just to say, um, people who live under conditions of marginality um, have to be listened to as a corrective for how it has always been done. So like that's what that language is about. It's about shifting the way things always happen where you have a seat at the table but your voice is not real. And so that being part of the community and listening first and transforming democracy in this participatory way is really what's what's necessary. But that's only a partial response to a great question. Mark, stop waiting to the end to come to the microphone. That's an excellent question, and I think we all wanted to hear more about that, uh, what the panelists had to say about it. I am so grateful to the three of you for being with us early on a Saturday morning uh, and having this conversation. It's one that I'm sure will continue to be had, uh, and, and I'm encouraging uh, our attendees to be mindful of how we want to imagine, uh, reimagine, imagine, vision uh, community safety uh, in our spaces as a form of liberation. Um, yeah, so, so thank you. So uh, on your programs, you see there's a theater performance uh, titled Dead Wrong. Uh, Lisa Langford is uh, the Cleveland-based play playwright uh, and actor who wrote Dead Wrong. I don't know if Lisa's in here. Lisa, you in here? Yes, hello, hello. Uh, we are so grateful to have Lisa with us today. Uh, she's written full-length plays, uh, Rastus and Hattie, How Blood Go and the Art of Longing, and short plays The Bomb and Revolting. She's the recipient of Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award because she is excellent, and she's a member of the Dramatist Guild and an artistic associ associate of the Black Lives, Black Words. Uh, I saw Lisa perform in Skeleton Crew at Da Bamba and was, so she, not only is she an amazing playwright, but she's also uh, a, a phenomenal actor. Uh, and, and performing her piece, Dead Wrong, today we have Ananias J. Dixon. Uh, I tell people if you're in the theater space in Cleveland and you haven't seen Ananias, you're at the wrong theater. Um, Ananias is a passionate professional uh, teaching artist, coach, director, and actor. He's a proud member of the Equity SAG AFTRA. Um, and he started acting at the age of 14 while attending the Cleveland School of the Arts. Go homegrown talent, we just won't leave, or we leave and we come back. Um, and he held his first role in Antoine Fisher in 2002, directed by Denzel Washington. He has performed professionally throughout Cleveland and regionally, including numerous roles at the Bomba Theater in Caramu House. And with that, I'm going to allow Ananias to take wherever he's most comfortable. Hey, jelly donuts. I ain't no religious nut or nothing like that. I ain't been to church in I don't know when, but I know it's a God. Lil G and Big G. Like Ganesh, Lil G. That's the motherfucker I like. The elephant with the four arms sitting in the lotus flower, that motherfucker is cold, ice cold. He's the remover of obstacles. Like, move or get out of my way, you know what I mean? That's a God. Lil G, that could be watching you from wherever Lil G guys reside and just be like, bam, bip, ta -da, to every hindrance in your path. I like that shit. But God, Big G, that motherfucker's crazy. First of all, he's white. Like, like Ted Danson white. Real chiseled and good looking in his youth and all gray and stately and shit in his dotage. No, don't get me wrong. 
Ted Dance is a good looking motherfucker. <laughs> I don't want to live in a world where Big G guy look like Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Hell no. So God, as I've been led to believe, is white. And white people have historically been capricious as fuck. Hmm? Slavery, capricious. Jim Crow, capricious. Donald Trump. Try as I might to envision a God that looks like me. When I'm in the foxhole, when the condom break, when I'm waiting on test results, I pray to Ted Danson. I try to stay on the wide side of right when it comes to Ted Danson. His shit could switch any minute. I mean, I read his tenets, I keep his laws. I mean, not every jot and tittle, but I ain't covered in nobody's wife or nothing. I know his word. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Now, now I, I understand feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, but what in the fuck does Ted Danson give a fuck about some prison? I mean, I know Jesus took a thief to paradise, but that was after the motherfucker paid his debt to society. All the people at the bottom of the heap that could have been name checked, orphans, widows, leopards, but the Bible, the Holy Word came down squarely in the camp of the incarcerated. <clears throat> like I said, Ted Danson, capricious as a motherfucker. So I look into it. Come to find out, Roman prisons gave no food, no phones, and absolutely no fucks. If you have somebody on the outside to bring you something to eat, or some medicine because they done flogged you before they locked you up, or a blanket to beat back the cold, you was asked out. And speedy trials hadn't been invented yet. So you was in there to whatever Pontius Pilate type motherfucker decided to hear your case. Could have been two, three years before you saw the inside of a courtroom. So a visit was more than just a visit. It was life. When I was in prison, so I was moved to start looking out for brothers in prison. At first, it started off with just a card or a letter, putting a few dollars on their books. But then here come Ted dancing, talking about more. Do more. So the next thing I know, I done caught the bus out to the penitentiary. You, you got to catch the bus out there. Ain't no other way to get out there but by bus. Four hours each way. They put them poor bastards way the fuck out there so we can forget about them. Like trash, like refuge, like something broken and scattered. We'd rather leave on the curb than to try to fix. Like, like in 2022 years of our collective minds, we couldn't come up with a better way than the Romans. I started um, corresponding with this one cat, Corey. He was on death row in federal prison, but that didn't mean much at the time because there was a moratorium on executions. The federal government hadn't killed nobody in 16 years. I mean, old age would take him out before the electric chair could get good and hot. I mean, he was locked up, but he was alive, right? When I was in prison, <laughs> usually, <laughs> Usually I come in there and he'd be sitting in there on the other side of the glass because it's not enough we lock the motherfucker away forever. We got to deprive the motherfucker of human touch too. He'd be in there smiling. Makes you feel good to mean that much to somebody. Makes you feel like that's how it's supposed to be in life, period. I see you, you see me, our eyes light up. We'll sit there and talk about movies and music. I brought up sports one time, but I'm a Browns fan, so that's the definition of cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> and we just chop it for like 45 minutes. Only, only this time ain't no light in Corey's eyes. There's a flicker of fear. Instead, I say, I say, Corey, what's wrong? He say, 
This motherfucker trying to kill every motherfucker he can before he get out of motherfucking office. I wish, I wish I could tell you I said something wise or kind or comforting. But I spent the last time I ever saw Corey just, just looking over his shoulder because, because I couldn't look him in the eye. The whole bus ride home, I, I pray to Ted Danson. I reminded that capricious, gray-haired fuck that his holy word said he came to set the prisoners free. I swore up and down on a stack of Bibles that if he let Corey live, I would visit every prison on the eastern seaboard. I I cried like a weak, like a punk ass bitch until I saw the news. They killed Corey. Just before midnight. <laughs> In six months, the federal government had murdered more people than they had in 16 years. Corey, um, Corey put out a statement to his lawyers. He said, um, he said he was sorry. He said, um, he said to remember his victims. He said, um, he said his last meal of a pizza and a strawberry shake was delicious, but he didn't get the jelly donut he asked for. What's with that, he said. This should be fixed, he said. This should be fixed. Who are we? to deny a dying man of a jelly donut. Who are we to kill him in the first place? I fucking, I fucking hate jelly donuts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ananias. Let's give another round of applause to Ananias. We've been moved by powerful presentations, by amazing dialogue. You've spoken your words and sometimes disagreeing with members of our uh, panelists, and that's great. We want that kind of engagement to happen. We now turn to our lunch. We have a, a beautiful meal out here for you, lots of food, please enjoy. I wanna encourage you to use this time to network, to get the support you need, to use the community care room, to do art, whatever you, you need to do, and we would love to have you be a part of that, and Tandy would love to have you come up and, and be a part of that. We also, at our tables here, we have conversation starters about what are you taking away from the think tank so far? Is there a social justice effort you'd like to sh share with somebody? Or what's emerging from the think tank that you think we need to do more to learn about and to, and to put into practice? So we'll have these conversation starters at the table. If you're gonna stay at the tables, please uh, stay, that's fine. If you're gonna go do something else, could you uh, vacate your space so that others can come and sit at the table? And there's lots of spaces outside uh, in the foyer here and downstairs. You're welcome to use the whole facility however you want to, to, for this time.